to give them severe discipline. Microphones can be really unruly. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, which we looked at last week, we had the marvelous vision of the kingdom, the church, that is to come, and uh, that uh, the nation of Judah or Israelites from any other country would have a part in participating in. All of that would be fulfilled when the Messiah comes. And that would be about 700 years after Isaiah prophesied these matters. But all of this, remember, all of this great vision of the future, well, it followed a severe denunciation of the nation of Judah and the current physical condition of that nation. And we saw that uh, God had promised a time of restoration amidst all of the condemnations for sin that had been expressed. Well, just as God invited his people, let us reason together in Isaiah 118, as he did that previously, he now invites them to walk in the light of the Lord. Uh, Again, from Isaiah uh, chapter 2 and verse 5, picking up where we left off last week, we read, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. So that is a great invitation, just as is the one inviting them to reason together with him. Now, we may not think about light being all that prominent in the book of Isaiah, but it actually is. We think more likely of it being in the New Testament. For example, when we read Isaiah 2.5, we're very likely to think of 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And let's take a look at that passage. This is the message then we have heard from the beginning and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We might also be reminded of Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, verse 8, where Paul gives a command uh, to the brethren there. And what he says to them in chapter 5 verse 8 is, For you were once darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So we do have things that we are reminded of, but Isaiah really is not done making use of the imagery of light. We next want to go to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. We're just going to have a quick study on the use of light in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. He says, To the law... And to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The light comes from the word, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Let's also notice Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first uh, he lightly esteemed, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death Upon them, a light has shined. Of course, 
that is quoted in the New Testament and applied to Jesus. Jesus is the great light that was observed in Galilee of the Gentiles. And of course, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And uh, so that harmonizes with uh, the other passages we just looked at. One more, or two more from um, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6. The first one is Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Then keeping that in mind, chapter 49 and verse, uh, I think it's verse 6. Indeed, he says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant? to raise up to the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So light is a uh, commodity that Isaiah frequently refers to, and uh, it can apply, of course, to Jesus, to the Word, uh, even to those who follow Jesus, as we learn in uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, you are the light of the world. And that light also goes to the Gentiles. That includes the Gentiles. So that is a prophecy, of one that not only speaks of light, but speaks of inclusion that Gentiles are not excluded from the gospel. The gospel is for all mankind. Well, that's our opening verse in Isaiah chapter 2 this evening, chapter 2, verse uh, 5, in which they are invited to walk in the light. However, having been granted the vision and reporting the vision that Isaiah saw, he now makes a, a sudden retreat to the way things are. That's how the book started out. And having seen this lofty vision, it is now the place to which we return. And the point is, in chapter 2, verse 6, the first part of it, the point is, for you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob. God is forsaking his own people. And why is he doing that? There are four reasons that are given in the, next, uh, in the remaining verse here in verses 7 and 8. First of all, they are filled with Eastern ways. What does that mean? They're filled with Eastern ways. By the way, the verb filled presents a picture, a picture of a, a vessel that is full, and there's just no more room to pour anything into it. Uh, you're going to start getting it all over everything else, a, a counter, the floor, the ground, whatever, because there's no more room to fill it. So they are filled to the brim, more or less, with eastern ways. That may refer to the caravans that came perhaps on their way to the south or the west to Africa, who came through the land from the east. And these probably involved uh, merchandise, the selling of things, and also bringing a number of ideas that were kind of strange to the land. In uh, the passage that we talked about last Sunday morning, where we have the grand vision of the church that is to come, in that vision, all nations will come to Zion. 
they will be uh, streams flowing upward to the top of the mountain, coming to the truth that is in Zion. But here, the contrast is that some are coming from the east and God's people are being totally influenced and overwhelmed by that. So it's an exact reversal of what would come 700 years later. At this current time, they were being overrun with influence from eastern ways. By the way, we still have a lot of eastern influence in this country today. Uh, there are uh, several that are uh, excited about the prospect of Buddhism, uh, several that uh, think Hinduism is neat. Uh, there are those who believe in reincarnation and some of the doctrines of those Eastern religions, astrology, New Ageism, and so on. Uh, we have not gotten away, at least as a country, from the fascination that some have with Eastern ways. But to continue uh, in uh, verse 6, they also have soothsayers like the Philistines. Now the Philistines were on the south and west, but these were coming from a different direction. However, they had soothsayers with them. These were forbidden in the law of Moses. Uh, if we take a look back at uh, Leviticus chapter 26, or 19 rather, in verse 26, we find this caution, Leviticus 19, 26. You shall not eat anything with the blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. And, uh, of course, that's also repeated, as you might expect that it would be, for the new generation about to inherit the land in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 10. In uh, that passage, we read, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer. Notice what all of the things that soothsaying is related to. It's not just one isolated thing. It is associated with several other things as well. Why are God's people so fascinated by such individuals as those with strange religious customs or soothsaying? Why? I think there are probably two reasons. Number one, Curiosity. Hey, this is not normal. This is not something we have as part of our laws. This is not any tradition that we possess. This is strange. Let's find out about this. Well, God already said, don't have anything to do with it. But the curiosity of people sometimes causes them to violate that commandment. And then a second reason is that there is a lack of faith in the true God. If we believed what God said, it would alleviate our curiosity and we would know that it is wrong and that there's no reason to delve into it. God has given us what he wants us to have. He has informed us. He has made us knowledgeable concerning the things that we need these are things we do not need and which will influence us in the wrong direction. Only those who are well grounded can resist such things. Apparently Israel was not well grounded. You would think they would be with the law that they had, that God had given them, but no, they are not. And by the way, in the New Testament, we are likewise warned in passages uh, such as Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Paul writes to the brethren in Colossae in chapter 2 and verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy 
and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So we should not think, oh, well, I would never be like those Israelites in the Old Testament. You know, I know better than that. Really? We have a lot of Christians who have fallen by the wayside. We need to follow the warning that Paul gives in Colossians 2 and verse 8. The second reason that God is uh, so unhappy with Israel, or Judah rather, their land is filled with wealth. Maybe it was brought in by the foreigners. Moses wrote that a king should not multiply wealth. And yet at the time of this king, wealth was being multiplied. That's Deuteronomy 17, 17. A third reason is that their land is full of horses. And you might say, what's wrong with that? Well, Deuteronomy 17, 16, same passage warns the king not to multiply horses. Well, why does God care about horses? Because they're used in war. And this might be considered a military buildup for some reason, perhaps not a legitimate reason, maybe just for expansion, not for defense. So that is the third reason. And then the fourth reason is the land is full of idols. Now, maybe not everybody had read Deuteronomy 17. That was perhaps not a prominent place in any of the scrolls. So they might not have read that. But how could they not know the, second, or the, the first two commandments? You shall have no other gods before me, Exodus 23, and then a lengthy explanation of the type of idolatry you should not have. No graven image of anything that is in heaven above or on earth beneath or, or beneath the earth. It's very clear that there are not to be any idols, and yet the land is full of idols. These all, especially the last one, merit punishment. Let's notice Isaiah 2.9. Uh, that which their own fingers have made, people bow down, each man humbles himself, that is, before the idol. All of this in, eight, in the first part of verse 9 has to do with idols. And then there's one last sentence. Therefore, do not forgive them. It would seem that this is Isaiah talking to God. All of these things merit punishment, but this last sentence you probably noticed is in the form of a command. One commentator suggests that Isaiah is telling God, you cannot possibly forgive them. And that may be the intent of what he's saying. Isaiah, though, foretells of the judgment that is certain to come, and we want to discuss that next in the rest of the chapter. First of all, let's notice verses 10 and 11. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. They are trying to hide from the terror of the Lord. And there's another passage later on that we'll read in verses 19 through 21 that more or less repeats what we're reading here. And either one of those passages may remind you of Revelation chapter 6 verses 15 through 17. In Revelation 6, 15 through 17, we read, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, 
hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Yes, we're reminded of that passage. Man with his lofty looks and pride shall be humbled. You've seen lofty looks, like how dare you challenge me on anything. Men are good at lofty looks. They're not so good at standing when the wrath of God is extended to them. So they shall be humbled, but the Lord and his majesty shall be exalted. And... um, If some of these maybe sound like the final judgment, you know, there's always uh, a similarity in the way these things are described. And uh, so that might not be altogether a wild notion. Let's read verses 12 through 18. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty. Upon uh, everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fortified wall, and all the ships of Tarshish, And upon all the beautiful sloops, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. Now, you might say, well, why is God picking on trees? Because they are mentioned. He's going to bring down everything that has been lifted up. The cedars, the oaks, and so forth. The fact is, God created those, but not for idols. He did not create these wondrous uh, trees. He did not create nature to participate in idolatry, but man has forced nature to do so. Man established high places in the hills and mountains upon which to practice their idolatry and sexual immorality. The two often went hand in hand. In fact, because of man's sin, nature has suffered. Man had used nature to practice his evil deeds, thus nature itself has to suffer. Because of man's sin, even the majestic and beautiful things of this world would suffer destruction. But he also includes high towers, and uh, they, as well as mountains, were for defense also. But they will not withstand Jehovah. Thus they provide false confidence. Men say, oh, well, we, we have our mountain to protect us, or we have our high towers to protect us. There, there is uh, no way that they are going to withstand God when he determines and appoints them a time to fall. Man might not be able to access those walls, but God can. There are two types of ships that are mentioned here that God will destroy. The first are those involved in commerce that are bringing some of these things from the east. The others are actually pleasure ships. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say cruise ships, but they are pleasure ships. And both are going to be destroyed. Man's loftiness will be made to bow down to the one who is worthy 
of actually being exalted. And the idols shall be abolished. This brings to mind a passage from Zechariah chapter 13 and uh, verse 2. In the uh, uh, next to last book of the Old Testament, chapter 13 and verse 2, we read, It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. And they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Yes, they were going to be abolished. They were going to be destroyed. They were going to be done away with. And they would no longer be a temptation to mankind. Now, chapter 2, verses 19 through 21 is the part that repeats what we talked about earlier. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. In that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each for himself to worship, to the moles and bats, to go to the clefts of the rock, and into the crags of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. So this is repeated in uh, uh, as graphic or even more explanatory way than it was mentioned previously. Now we come to the last verse of the chapter, <clears throat> verse 22. Sever yourselves from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? While it is safe to walk in the light of the Lord, one should sever himself from the one who is an idolater. Why? Because it's from a man. The idol basically is nothing. But what about the man who is following the idol? He is a man who breathes. His breath is in his nostrils. How long is he going to live without a breath? How long will that go on? He breathes in and out, and God can take away that breath whensoever he wills. After all, God gave it to man to begin with, didn't he? He breathed into man the breath of life, and he can remove it also. He has given unto us a life and breath in all things, Acts chapter 17. Furthermore, man does not exist by his own strength. He is not self-existent as God is. Man is a part of the creation. He didn't make himself. He cannot sustain himself. Look at the mightiest of people that you can think of, and a uh, hundred years later, they have all perished. The great armies of Greece, the great Roman armies, uh, all of those who have uh, fought, and uh, had, uh, were mighty men of David and all of those, they are, they're all gone after a time. Man cannot operate on his own strength. So of what account is he? Zero. God is the one that we should be counting on, not man. No man can be trusted to replace God. Only God has wisdom, power, might, majesty. Man does not have those things. Tonight, you might ask yourself, who am I trusting in? Am I trusting in a man? Am I trusting in a woman? Am I trusting in a family member? 
Am I trusting in someone that I think is a religious authority? Or am I trusting in the Word of God? The Word of God is where our trust needs to be. The Word of man is of no account. Only the Word of God has light. Only God possesses true majesty and power. And so we need to walk with him in light. We need to reason with him. Let us walk in the light and glorify him as he is the only one worthy of majesty and power. This evening, if you've never obeyed the gospel, the word tells us what you need to do. The word says that you must uh, have faith in God and that you must uh, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that you should repent of your sins, confess Jesus to be the Son of God, be buried with him in baptism so that your sins can be washed away. This is not man's plan. This is what God said in his word, and which you find in Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, and several other passages. Then you need to walk in the light the rest of your life, depending on God's word. If you've already done that, but are not living true and faithful to that, we invite you to make things right between yourself and God. Can we help you spiritually this evening? Let us know while we stand and while we sing.